Now here is the result of the radio questionnaire. And now the results of our survey on spare time activities and sports. We wanted to know how people spend their spare time, so we interviewed women and men around the town during the whole of last week. Here's what we found out. Only 40% of men interviewed claimed to do some kind of physical exercise, while 50% of the women we talked to said that they follow a regular program of exercise. We also talked about watching sport on TV, and both groups claimed to spend some time on this. 41% of men interviewed do this, and 30% of women. We also wanted to find out exactly what form of exercise these people do. So we asked about different sports and activities. Jogging was by far the most popular, with 20% of men and 18% of women. Most of them do this during the week, either in the morning before going to work or in the evening after work. Football was also popular with the men. 13% claim to play, mainly at the weekend, on Saturdays. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Not surprisingly, none of the women claimed to play. Cricket was another popular sport among the men, with 19% claiming to play. Again, no women mentioned this sport. A lot of people also said they took some form of exercise other than these team sports. 80% of men and 90% of women said they regularly walked as a form of exercise, either as part of their daily routine to get to work or at the weekends in their spare time. Athletics was also mentioned, but not by many. Only 10% of men said they did this. None of the women we spoke to mentioned it at all. Dancing was also mentioned as a form of exercise. 3% of men and women mentioned this, and also yoga. 5% of women said they did this regularly, and 2% of men. Finally, a small number of people included gardening as a form of exercise. 11% of men said they did this and 13% of women. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. Today I have with me Sandy Richardson of the local Workforce Centre. And she'll be talking about that critical step towards the goal of employment the interview. Sandy, what is an interview for and what's the best way to approach it? A job interview is simply a meeting between you and a potential employer to discuss your qualifications and see if there is a fit. The employer wants to verify what they know about you and talk about your qualifications. If you have been called for an interview, you can assume that the employer is interested in you. The employer has a need that you may be able to meet, so it's your goal to identify that need and convince the employer that you're the one for the job. As everyone knows, interviews can be stressful, but when you're well prepared, there's no reason to panic. Preparation is the key to success in a job search, and you can begin by collecting together all the documents you may need for the interview, such as extra copies of your resume, lists of references, and letters of recommendation. You could also take some work samples, selecting from what you have designed, drawn, or written, for instance. And make sure you have a pen and pad of paper for taking notes. The next step is to find out about the post, the more you know about the job, the employer, and the industry, the better prepared you will be to target your qualifications. Always request a job description from the employer and research employer profiles at the Chamber of Commerce or local library. You could also try to network with people who work for the company or with employees of companies associated with it. The next step is to match your qualifications to the requirements of the job. A good approach is to write out your qualifications along with the job requirements. Think about some standard interview questions and how you might respond. 
Most questions are designed to find out more about you, your qualifications, or to test your reactions in a given situation. If you don't have any experience or skills in a required area, think about how you might compensate for those deficiencies. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. During an interview, it's important that you be yourself. Get a good night's sleep and plan your travel to be there in plenty of time so that you're not arriving out of breath with 30 seconds to spare. Don't, though, present yourself for the interview too early, 10 minutes at most. In the interview, listen carefully to each question asked. Take your time in responding and make sure your answers are positive. It's important to express a good attitude and show that you're willing to work, eager to learn, and are flexible. If you are unsure of a question, don't be afraid to ask for clarification. In fact, it's sometimes a good strategy to close a response with a question for the interviewer. In general, focus on your qualifications and look for opportunities to personalize the interview. Briefly answer questions with examples of how you responded in comparable situations from either your life or previous job experiences. Something you should avoid are yes or no responses to questions, but don't dwell too long on non-job related topics. Use caution if you are questioned about your salary requirements. The best strategy is to avoid the question until you have been offered a job. Questions about salary asked before there is a job offer are usually screening questions that may eliminate you from consideration, so be warned. On the other hand, it isn't inappropriate to show your enthusiasm if your first impressions of the interview and of the employer are good ones. So, if the job sounds like what you are looking for, say so. Keep in mind that the interview is not over when you are asked if you have any questions. Come prepared to ask a couple of specific questions that, again, show your knowledge and interest in the job. Close the interview in the same friendly, positive manner in which you started. When the interview is over, leave promptly. Don't overstay your time. Think about the interview and learn from the experience. Evaluate the success and failures. The more you learn from the interview, the easier the next one will become you'll become much more confident. To close, here are a few more tips. First, maintain good eye contact throughout the interview and be aware of nonverbal body language. Second, dress a step above what you would wear on the job. Go to the hairdressers, have a shave, etc. Remember that your appearance is a key indicator of whether you have the right attitude, so it can pay to give some thought to how you look. And finally, don't be a clock watcher. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Good evening, everyone. It's great to be here to talk to you about staying safe on holiday. Before I came this evening, I did a little research on where students like to go for their holidays and came up with two different regions, Latin America and India. So, um, I've been looking at the crime figures for both areas and I thought I'd start by talking a bit about that. Then I'll give you some advice about how to avoid becoming a victim of crime. Okay, first of all, Let's look at what kinds of crime are committed most in different regions. Um, OK, I'll start with India. Generally, India isn't thought of as a dangerous place for individuals, but there has been an increase in handbag theft in recent years. So keep an eye on your bag when you're out in the street. Right. Now, let's look at Latin America. Hmm. Of course, you do realise that not all Latin American countries are the same, but it is true to say that guns are used in a high percentage of crimes across the region. Looking at the figures, it seems that gun crime is a serious problem throughout. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30.
I can see some of you are thinking that it all sounds rather dangerous, but I know lots of people who've been there and had a really great time. They followed advice from the authorities, like making sure they didn't wear expensive jewellery in the street. And I'd certainly advise anyone travelling to Latin America to do the same. Another thing you should be careful of is not to go to lonely places at night. But of course, that's the same anywhere. But I must say, you do have to be very careful in some parts of Latin America when you take your money out of a cash machine. Sometimes you find that thieves stand very close to people at cash machines and take their money as it comes out. Okay, so now I'll finish by talking a little bit about India. I've actually been to India, and I didn't have any feeling that it was dangerous at all. First of all, I went on an organised tour with a group of people. This is definitely the best way to go because it's so much safer. I mean, I didn't go anywhere without the group. And we had a tour guide who spoke the local language and knew the area. In fact, I remember now, she warned us not to go off with strangers, even if they seem nice and friendly. But again, you wouldn't do that at home either, would you? As you listen to the first part of the talk, tick the appropriate box for questions thirty-one to thirty-five. Good morning. My name is Professor Sarah Lennon, and I'm here today to talk to you about the works of one of the greatest writers in the English language, Charles Dickens. He wrote many books, and if we bear in mind that there are over two thousand characters in his stories, we can get an idea of the complexity of his work. I've selected one novel from your reading list that I would like to talk about to illustrate his genius, namely. Dombey and Son, but before we look at this work in earnest, I thought it might be a good idea to have a quick look at his life, and also at a few of the major events that happened during his lifetime, so that we can try to put his writing into perspective. Dickens was born on the seventh of February, eighteen twelve, at the time when his father was working in Portsmouth Dockyard. His father was transferred to London in eighteen fourteen. To help give us a picture of the time Dickens was born into, it's worth noting that in eighteen fourteen, when Dickens was two, the first efficient steam locomotive was constructed in Newcastle upon Tyne. Then, in eighteen seventeen, the year that Queen Victoria was born and Waterloo Bridge in London was opened. The Dickens family moved away from London, and to give Dickens' life a literary perspective, in the following year, works by other famous English writers were published: Jane Austen's *Northanger Abbey* and *Persuasion*, Mary Shelley's *Frankenstein*, and Scott's *The Heart of Midlothian*. When Dickens was almost ten, his family circumstances changed. And in 1822, the family moved back to London. In 1824, John Dickens was arrested for debt, and imprisoned in the Marshalsea near London Bridge in London. This event had a profound effect on Dickens' writing. From 1827, Charles Dickens had various jobs as solicitor's clerk, freelance reporter, and newspaper reporter. As you listen to the second part of the talk, answer the questions. In December eighteen thirty-three, Dickens had his first story, *A Dinner at Poplar Wall*, published in the Monthly Magazine. In the same year, the SS Royal William became the first vessel to cross the Atlantic Ocean by steam alone. In eighteen thirty-six, two important events happened. Dickens published the first series of sketches by Boz, and the publishers Chapman and Hall suggested his first novel, *The Pickwick Papers*. In April of the same year, the second major event took place: 
Dickens married Catherine Hogarth. And in 1837, the year that Queen Victoria became Queen of England and Samuel B. Morse developed Telegraph, the novel Oliver Twist began publication in Bentley's Miscellany in 24 monthly instalments. You may not be aware that serialization like this was common in Dickens' time. In the subsequent year, that is, in 1838, the serialization of Nicholas Nickleby started and appeared in 20 instalments. Dickens' novel, The Old Curiosity Shop, began serialization in 1840. This was the year the first postage stamp, the Penny Post, was brought in by Rowland Hill, and the year the first bicycle was produced. The next major publication for Dickens was in 1842, when the first part of Martin Chuzzlewit appeared, and in 1848, Dombey and Son was published. Now, uh, do you have any questions before we go on to look at this work in some depth? No? No?